Uh, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, our speaker today, Professor Stephen Ratner, uh, who's joining us from the University of Michigan, where he is the Bruno Sima Collegiate Professor uh, of Law. Uh, Professor Ratner's teaching and research focuses on uh, public international law uh, and a range of uh, challenges facing governments and international institutions, including things such as territorial disputes, uh, counterterrorism strategies, ethnic conflict, and accountability for human rights violations. Uh, Professor Ratner has written and lectured extensively on the law of war and is also interested in the intersection of international law and moral philosophy, as well as other theoretical issues. Uh, what's particularly, I think, impressive about Professor Ratner's uh, work is the extensive service and experience uh, in legal advising that informs uh, much of his uh, teaching and research. So, so just to give you a, a brief example, uh, he began his legal career as an attorney advisor in the office of the legal advisor at the U.S. State Department. In 1998, he was appointed by the U.N. Secretary General to a three-person group of experts to consider options for bringing the Khmer Rouge uh, to justice. Uh, he since advised uh, several governments, NGOs, and international organizations on a range of international law issues. Uh, he served in the legal division of the International Committee of the Red Cross in Geneva. And in 2010, 2011, he was a member of the UN's three-person panel of experts on accountability in Sri Lanka. Uh, which advised Secretary General Ban Ki-moon on human rights violations related to the end of the Sri Lankan Civil War. Uh, Professor Ratner holds degrees from Yale, Princeton, and let me practice my French, the Institut Universitaire de Haute Etude Internationale uh, in Geneva, uh, where he ended MA. Uh, he's uh, published on, on several issues in international uh, law, the laws of war, investment law, uh, human rights, and we're very fortunate today he's going to be uh, uh, talking about uh, some arguments and themes uh, from one of his most recent books. Uh, can I, yeah, can I plug it? Uh, the Thin uh, Justice of International Law, A Moral Reckoning of the Law of Nations. Um, very much looking forward and very glad to, to, to have you uh, with us this fall. Uh, so thank you. Thank you, you, Michael, for the very nice introduction and, and Francois for uh, having me here at the Nathanson Center and for this uh, to be part of this uh, great series that you are fortunate to have uh, where you can have lawyers and philosophers talking about issues of joint interest. Um, uh, I know about the Nathanson Center from uh, quite up close because I, was, uh, I had the honor to be on the review committee uh, that the Canadian government sent up, uh, provincial or Canadian? Uh, government set up several years ago. Oh, it was just the university. Okay, okay. the university <laughs> for just for the uh, certification. And so I'm amazed at all the wonderful things you folks have. And so it's great to be part of it again. Um, the um, origin of the project that led to this book is a sense of frustration that um, I have had about two of the key disciplines for understanding and prescribing for global justice and concern that these two disciplines were not properly engaging with each other. So um, international lawyers, with whom I had the most familiarity at, at, at originally, had a very limited idea of justice that involved criminal justice or international courts uh, that often saw ethical inquiries as ultra virus, um, that ignored their own ethical uh, predispositions, um, and that failed to appreciate the insights of several generations of contemporary political philosophy. Um, on the other hand, political and moral philosophers stayed clear of international law, seeing its origin in power politics and historical contingencies as making it fatally flawed, um, or at best a vessel into which to pour ideal theory, and um, even morally deficient in its failure to advance a strong cosmopolitan agenda. Um, the reasons for their suspicion are quite complex. Um, I think they somewhat lie in the difference between the value of ideal versus non-ideal theory. Um, this is really unfortunate because most of these insights have a lot to learn from each other as we prescribe principles for a more just world. Um, and so this led me to um, not only think about how we can get the disciplines to talk to one another, but to make my own uh, substantive contribution to this effort. And so what I decided to do was to examine international law's ethical grounding um, a project which some philosophers have done, but 
um, in a different way from the way they have done. In other, my way was not to come up with an ideal theory of global justice and then propose norms consistent with it or criticize the norms that we have, but rather to look at the existing norms, a sort of bottom-up approach that states have actually agreed upon and see whether they measure up to a bona fide uh, but not ideal standard of global justice. Uh, now, I came to this admittedly with a professional identity as an international lawyer that did not, if I was going to look at myself in the mirror every morning, see international law as immoral writ large, um, as many of the theorists had made it out to be. And my sense that they were missing something about the moral basis of the rules um, or the institutional reasons for the rules we have. I was also concerned that some of the proposals that the philosophers had for reforming international law um, would actually some, sacrifice some of the achievements of international law um, or would end up relying on institutions that are institutionally incapable of doing what they would like them to do. Um, but I also wanted to show international lawyers that many of the key interpretive disputes that they have um, are actually based on deep disagreements about ethical issues, in particular disagreements about the importance of peace versus human rights. Um, and so when I engaged in that review um, that led to this book, I discovered or I found or argued that international law does conform in many respects to a meaningful standard of global justice, um, but that it falls short in some key areas and that we must uh, recognize and strive for norms that meet a higher standard of justice. Um, I undertook this inquiry not merely to make a point to philosophers and to international lawyers, but also because I think that norms that are ethically defensible are more likely to be complied with by states and other actors. And I believe that respect for the right rules of international law is an important contributor to a more just world. And to the extent that we can find good moral reasons for complying with them, we increase those prospects. And if we don't find good moral reasons to comply with them, then we have a sense of what needs to be reformed. Um, this approach, I think, is also consistent with a linkage between law and ethics that is made by the Australian uh, legal philosopher Peter Kane, um, that law can help us understand what is ethical and just in the first place, that it's not, that it's constitutive and not merely derivative of or second best form of ethics, and I believe that quite strongly. So let me just explain uh, a little bit about what I mean by global justice for the purposes of this book and then run you through my framework and then a couple of examples, um, and, um, which are based on the materials that I circulated for you today. So the form of justice that I have in mind for this book is quite broad, and it's not at all limited to distributive justice, which is the focus of a lot of the philosophical work. Um, it's about relations and allocations, about what people deserve, but it's not about material wealth. Um, and until fairly recently, as I say, that had been the focus of global justice scholarship in the philosophical realm, um, based in particular on the idea of whether the Rawlsian difference principle could be extended to the global sphere. Although there is obviously now in the last you know, 10 years, 20 years, a lot more work in philosophy about other issues, about self-determination, about the laws of war, about a lot of other things. Um, so my ambit for global justice is one that's focused on um, uh, any rules uh, or, 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 excuse me, any processes or outcomes that assign rights and duties to global actors. Uh, in a way that it's clear what, e what, e what each actor is entitled to or required to, ha to, to have or to do. So it's a very broad notion of justice, which is similar to Brian Barry's notion. Um, so that's the, the ambit of global justice. Now, what's the standard of global justice that I use for evaluating the rules that I do? Well, the standard that I use and that I'd like to explain to you a little bit about is uh, what I call a standard based on two prongs or two pillars. And it's a standard that says that international law norms are just if and only if, first, they advance interstate or internal peace uh, as appropriate, and second, if they do so in a way that respects in the sense of not interfering with the enjoyment of basic human rights. OK, so where do I get these two pillars from? Well, these two pillars are derived from the logic of discovery and the logic of appropriateness. Uh, a, a lot, two logics which actually Rawls himself recognized um, in a number of his works. Um, the logic of discovery basically says that we can look to the public culture, 
in this case, the global systems, public culture, as it were. And I believe that the moral foundation for the global system that we have today, um, as represented in the key goals of the United Nations, are in fact um, peace and human rights, the first pillar and the second pillar. But the logic of appropriateness, uh, which Rawls also recognized, says that even if we discover those as being uh, imminent in our public culture, we still need to justify them as a basis for a theory of global justice. And how is it that those two values can be the proper inputs into global justice? So let me just defend those two pillars. So the, the first pillar is the pillar of peace. And um, to me, it, peace is key to global justice. It's a key component of global justice because war is the greatest threat to human welfare and flourishing, such that rules to be just should aim to reduce the chance of warfare. Um, my notion of peace is broad in that it covers both interstate and internal conflicts, but it's narrow in the sense that it refers to the absence of armed conflict and not the broad notion of Galtung and others of the elimination of all conflict of the lion lying down with the lamb. So I see precondition, peace as not a precondition for justice, but as an element of justice. Um, now maybe those who work in a domestic paradigm, as Rawls originally did, can assume that we've left the state of nature and that we can drive justice with a precondition of peace. But for me, the threat of warfare between and within states is so ongoing that it is right to expect international law to advance the avoidance of war. For otherwise, we simply assume away the key challenge to global justice, which is the threat of war. So peace is not a precondition, and a fortiori, it's not an opposition to justice. And so although we can have debates in criminal law about the balance between peace and justice, I think that my notion of justice is much broader than the criminal law notion. And so I believe in peace as a component and not in opposition to justice. It's also clear, however, that um, international law has to do more than just promote peace. We can't promote peace at any cost. We have to be concerned about the effect on individual human rights. And so my second pillar is one that is grounded in human rights. Um, I said, uh, to reiterate, that the pillar says that international law rules must not, uh, must respect peace in a way that doesn't, um, that respects in the sense of not interfering with basic human rights. So by basic human rights, I mean a subset of human rights that I regard as those rights responding to the most direct threats to the individual, a combination of core civil and political and economic, social, and cultural rights. I have a pragmatic conception, again, a bottom-up conception of basic human rights. It's not based on any top-down theory, but based on what I think states have actually recognized um, through not only international human rights law, but also through the rhetoric at the global level. Um, in a way that I think avoids questions, or at least tries to put aside questions about cultural relativism. And so I come up in the, and you have it in the materials, of a list of certain core basic civil and political and economic, social, and cultural rights um, that are about eliminating the most direct threats to the individual. By respect and non-interference um, uh, in terms of what international law rules have to be, I see that as a negative concept, that the rules must not lead to the violation of those rights at an aggregate level. It is not, however, necessary that they affirmatively promote the observance of these rights. And I'll explain my choice for that in a, in a few minutes. But it is, a, it is, a, um, uh, it is not a demand on, on, on all international law rules that they affirmatively promote human rights, but simply that they do not interfere with the enjoyment of the basic human rights. Um, now, as I describe these two pillars, you can see that my reasoning is primarily consequentialist. I look at the effect of the rules on peace. I look at the effect of the rules on the enjoyment of uh, basic human rights writ large. Um, I ask whether the rules, if, if observed, would have certain effects. And I endorse a consequentialist approach primarily for the reasons that uh, Bob Gooden wrote in terms of his, his, uh, his defense of util utilitarianism as a public philosophy, um, but also because my training as a lawyer makes me professionally think about consequences. I think that consequentialism also helps us avoid some of the debates among global justice scholars about whether we have a basic structure at the global level so that the Rawlsian idea can be imposed at the uh, applied at the global level. 
Um, and I think there's lots of interesting scholarship about whether we have a basic structure, but I think that we can avoid those questions if we don't apply the Rawlsian um, model at all, but just apply a consequentialist model. Um, uh, obviously, consequentialism involves predictions, which can be wrong. Uh, mine are grounded in history, in social science, and at times um, in my own seat of the pants sense of how international law rules will affect behavior. Um, and so in that sense, justice is contingent on facts. If my predictions turn out to be wrong, then so does the appraisal. But I'm happy to have the debate on those terms um, in terms of what the um, likely outcomes would be of certain rules. At the same time, I'm not wholly consequentialist. I recognize at times that the second pillar in particular can play the role of uh, trumps or side constraints in Nozick's terms, um, or at least exclusionary reasons in uh, Raz's terms, that they might keep certain arguments off the table. Um, and for instance, a international law rule that would allow torture of a few people to promote the peace of many would, in my view, still be unjust. And so I'm willing to deploy the second pillar at times in a, in a, um, in a non-consequentialist, more deontological way. Um, and I will, and you'll see within some of the examples that I, that I give today. Um, so um, how do the pillars interact? Um, well, I describe a little bit in the book. I'll just uh, briefly um, uh, sort of describe the test. If a norm or proposed norm survives scrutiny under the first pillar, it's presumptively just. At that point, we look and see how, how it does under the second pillar. And it will survive scrutiny if it passes that test as well, but will be unjust if it doesn't. If it doesn't pass the second pillar, we have to think about ways of adjusting the norm, reforming the norm, so that it passes the second pillar in a way that does the least damage to the first pillar. And if it doesn't pass the first pillar, we have to think about ways to reform it in a way that passes the first pillar in a way that does the least damage um, to the second pillar. So in that sense, my, um, my proposal is more about, um, sorry, um, lost my page here. Um, yikes, what did I do with it? Just one second, that was pretty good. Open up the book and I lose my page here. Four, three, two, five. Okay, sorry. Um, in that sense, um, it's more about two principles, about balancing two principles than it is about a binary conception. And if you read the book, you'll see that I and try to be fairly nuanced in my conclusions about, about the norms. It's not that a norm is always just or always unjust. It's more like a sliding scale rather than a rigid formula. And indeed, in some cases, I have to give provisional answers. Some of my positions about international trade law, international investment law, um, are quite contingent about current interpretations of those rules by the WTO or by investor state tribunals. And that if those interpretations changed, then the justice of those rules would also change. Um, I take this framework and I apply it to what I regard as the core norms of international law. Use of force, non-intervention, self-determination, sovereign equality, participation in decision making of international organizations, the scope of, of protection of human rights, um, which I'll talk about today, international trade and investment. Um, and I also talk about several areas where the framework has shortcomings, notably international humanitarian law, international criminal law, and international environmental law. And, and I circulated the full table of contents. Um, at each stage in the book, what I try to do is not only appraise the rules that we have, but also appraise proposals made by states and scholars for different rules to see how they would fare under the two pillars. Um, and often those counter, those counter proposals pull in different directions. So for instance, the rules on self-determination, which under which international law recognizes a very, very limited right of secession. Um, there is one proposal offered by a number of governments that goes in one direction, no secession ever. There are other proposals that go in that philosophers have offered, which have said lots of situations where secession should be allowed. And I look at those alternative proposals under the two pillars to, say how, to see how they fare as well. Um, and the result of my inquiry are a set of conclusions as to whether or not this two-pillared standard that I offer permits or prohibits a particular rule of international law. 
um, and whether or not the standard permits or prohibits an alternative. I don't attempt to, nor do I need to ask whether my standard requires a particular norm, which is what philosophers do. Um, they come up with a standard, and then they say, well, this is the, you know, the only international law rule that's going to meet my standard, and so we need to reform the rule thusly. That's not my goal, although at times I do justify a norm that is not merely permitted but required by the standard. Um, my project is also one that focuses on rules and not on acts. So again, for example, I don't ask whether it's just to allow the unilateral secession of Catalonia from Spain. Rather, what I ask is whether it's just to have a rule on self-determination that may or may not permit that secession. In my view, it wouldn't permit it, but you know, just like it wouldn't permit the secession of, of, uh, of Quebec. Um, but I'm not asking about the individual cases. Indeed, I recognize that there may be just rules that occasionally have to be violated. Um, and there may be um, uh, unjust rules that occasionally have to be followed. That's uh, you know, basic moral philosophy. Um, but my focus really is on the rules themselves um, and not on the acts. OK, so why do I call this the thin justice of international law? Well, I call it thin. I call my standard thin for some of the same reasons that Walzer distinguishes between thick morality within communities and thin morality um, at the global level. Um, this is not a standard we use or should use to appraise the justice of domestic institutions within a constitutional democracy. It's less demanding on individuals, it recognizes the interests of states, and it reflects the state of international relations, which are characterized by a diverse group of states and limitations of international institutions. In other words, it's a standard that reflects what I think law can do at the international level. At the same time, um, I think it's a strong standard. And so I like to, it's thin but strong. I like to kind of analogize it to sort of a piece of titanium. It represents a real standard of global justice such that if international law norms corresponded to it and states observed those norms, we would have a more just world. It's not a least common denominator meant to capture as many of the norms as possible. And if you read the book, you'll see that some rather important norms do not pass uh, the standard of the two pillars. Now certainly there are other standards out there. Um, uh, and we can ask why not, base, uh, why not uh, judge international law rules based on maximal protection of human rights, uh, or distributive justice, or equality. And I have sort of three answers to that. First, um, I think any of those alternatives are incomplete. Uh, we need to have peace as a separate value. Uh, the protection of human rights alone need not advance peace. Um, and I can give you some examples of that. And I don't think that peace's value is solely in the protection of human rights. Peace is not merely instrumentally about the protection of human rights. Peace has its own independent value in my view. So we need that first pillar. Secondly, I think um, those other conceptions are unnecessary. Because I work from the assumption that we have a body of international law devoted to the maximal protection of human rights. That body is called international human rights law. And so my question is whether all of the other rules of international law on the use of force, on trade, on investment, on sovereign equality, um, on the territorial scope of human rights protections, need to do what human rights law does. And I argue that the rest of international law does not need to have the proactive goals that human rights law does. And thirdly, I think that using those as a sole pillar uh, of justice, maximal protection of human rights or distributive justice or equality, is unrealistic. Again, that there are institutional constraints on what international law can do. Um, however, taking those institutional constraints into account, um, which is something, for instance, that Alan Buchanan has done in his philosophical work, is not an apology for the status quo, which I challenge in many respects, in which I think international law should challenge. Um, it's clear that against some of these other standards, international law may well force, fall short. Um, and I don't think the fact that philosophers have found many international rules, including 
sovereign equality or even the existence of the state system or the ban on the use of force, no matter who's invading for whatever reason, um, that they have found those to be immoral. I mean, I, but I um, am not really engaged in the same project that they are. Um, I do, however, um, in my final chapter, offer a thicker standard of global justice to which I think international law should strive, and I offer a strategy to get there. OK, so I've spent about um, a little bit of time explaining to you what the book's about, what my standard of global justice is. I want to now spend the remaining 15 minutes or so uh, giving you two examples from the book. And these are both examples that concern the territorial scope of human rights protection. The starting point of international law regarding the, uh, the territorial scope of a state's um, uh, capacity, or not really capacity, but uh, authority to protect human rights is a territorial conception. That is to say that states have no duty and no right to affirmatively protect human rights of those beyond their borders. They don't have a duty to do so uh, in the general position uh, because under the human rights standards, um, it says that states' duties shall be to those under their territorial jurisdiction, um, which is mostly 90% territorial. Let's just assume that for now. And they don't have a right to affirmatively take measures because the norm of non-intervention prohibits states from taking those sorts of measures on the territory of another state. Now, they can promote human rights beyond their own borders, but they, can't, um, uh, they don't have a right to affirmatively take coercive or governmental measures to protect human rights of those beyond their borders. Um, now, that's the starting point of international law. And I think that's a starting point that is fully justified under the two pillars. I think it's a, it's a starting point that's justified under the peace pillar as a way of preventing uh, interstate tensions. And we have plenty of historical examples of when one state starts seeking um, the right to re fix the human rights practices of another state. And whether those are examples from the interwar period or whether those are examples from Iraq, they, all, they often lead to a very, very bad result. Um, and as far as the human rights pillar goes, I basically share the insight of Bob Gooden that, in fact, um, uh, the decision to leave the primary protection of human rights up to each state is justifiable from a consequentialist perspective um, as an efficient way of allocating uh, the, our sort of global duties to protect human rights, our meaning individual uh, or, or community-based duties. Um, and that generally it's best to leave the protection up to territorially discrete units. At the same time, even as I say this, there are obviously some exceptions to this starting point. Um, and indeed, international law actually recognizes a set of exceptions to the territorially-based starting point for the protection of human rights. Um, and I mentioned three in the book. I only really have time to talk about two of them today. And these are situations where states actually have a right, and some would say a duty, but for our purposes, let's just say a right, to protect human rights um, abroad. Um, these are doctrinally distinct. The three categories um, are extraterritorial um, protection of human rights, universal jurisdiction, and humanitarian intervention. They're treated under three different areas of the law. Um, jurisdiction, uh, the first is treated sort of under human rights, the second sort of treated under jurisdiction, and the third is treated under use of force. But they're conceptually linked in that they are recognition that the pure territorially based starting point is not acceptable. So let's talk about universal jurisdiction. Universal jurisdiction is, uh, for those of you not familiar with it, the authority that um, states have under very limited circumstances to prescribe law and uh, even bring to trial uh, those accused of human rights abuses beyond their borders with no, no connection to the forum state. So it, it's, it's the international law rule that allows state A to prosecute somebody for a crime committed on the territory of state B, even if that person is not a national of state A and even if the victims were not nationals of state A. Um, it's a rule that applies to a handful of international crimes. Um, it's a rule that has certain conditions, namely that you're generally the state of national, the state that wants to prosecute is supposed to give 
the forum state a chance to prosecute, but it is, it is recognized as a, um, a authority that states have under limited circumstances. Now, ph some philosophers have tried to justify this idea of universal jurisdiction. And, but what they tend to do is think about, well, what sort of crimes might justify uh, a state outside the, the, the place of commission having an interest or prosecuting? And they think of it in these sort of abstract terms. What makes a crime of global concern or of transnational concern? But what these philosophers tend to neglect is that the, the actual practice of universal jurisdiction is one that has a very clear interstate element because it involves one state asserting the authority to prosecute offenses that take place on the territory of another state and bring to trial typically somebody who has the nationality of that state in their courts. And so it has a true interstate dimension that is often neglected in the philosophical literature that's purely trying to think about what makes it of international concern. Now, um, how does this rule of international law that permits states to exercise universal jurisdiction fare under the two pillars? Well, as far as the peace pillar goes, um, there have been arguments made that the exercise of universal jurisdiction could lead to interstate tensions. Uh, the tensions between uh, Chile and, um, and the UK over Pinochet, or the tensions between Belgium and Israel when Belgium started uh, indicting Israeli officials in their courts for uh, activities that took place in Lebanon. Um, and certainly there are arguments that um, universal jurisdiction could um, exacerbate civil conflicts. So you know, if the FARC and the Colombia government reach in some kind of a deal of partial amnesty, and then some foreign state starts uh, you know, arresting some ex-FARC person who travels there and puts them on trial. This could unravel the peace agreement. Um, and so there are legitimate concerns about uh, the effect of the permissive rule, even the permissive rule, on peace. Now, as it turns out, a number of scholars, Maxim Alanger, uh, Catherine Sicking, and others, have shown that the actual practice of universal jurisdiction has not led to um, anything more than short-term tensions, um, but has not really led to unraveling of peace agreements um, or has not really prevented peace agreements from taking hold. Um, so on the peace pillar, you know, it's sort of hard to know. I mean, there is a potential out there for universal jurisdiction, but there is no clear evidence that it fails the peace pillar. Um, on the other hand, as far as the human rights pillar goes, um, my view would be that if we did not have universal jurisdiction, what we would end up having is effectively uh, the possibility of complete impunity for those who cannot be tried at home. And in that situation, the victims of human rights would have their rights completely unvindicated. And that, in a sense, we can't have, um, it would be unjust for international law to leave that option off the table, to leave, off the, leave the option of vindication of human rights off the table. And so what I end up concluding is that the international law rule that we have is actually one that is, is required by the second pillar, that a rule permitting uh, the exercise of universal jurisdiction uh, is necessary under the second pillar. Um, at the same time, I would say that a rule that mandated universal jurisdiction, which some scholars have, have, have argued for, but which is not, is, is not in fact the law, would be deeply problematic under the first pillar because it would mean that every state would have to sort of pass laws and actively prosecute um, any foreign um, uh, person who committed human rights abuses if they landed on their territory. Now, we do have some treaty-based regimes that allow for that. But I think that a treaty-based regime is a little bit different because states are consenting to that up front. It's a little different from a customary law rule. I can say a little bit more about that maybe in the question and answer period. But the bottom line with respect to universal jurisdiction is that I would argue that the rule that we have, which is a permissive but not mandatory rule, is one that actually offers maybe not the best but a very good fit um, under the two pillars, insofar as it um, advances or at least does not detract from global peace and does so in a way that protects um, 
through vindication, the basic human rights of the individuals. And I would include among those basic human rights the idea of vindication. And of course, you know, we can have an argument about whether that's a basic human right at all. If you talk to victims, it certainly is a basic human right. OK, let me just say a word about um, humanitarian intervention, and then I'll stop. Um, so as far as humanitarian intervention goes, we have this black letter rule of international law that says that, un that unilateral humanitarian intervention is always prohibited. That the only um, legitimate actor for carrying out um, uh, humanitarian intervention, uh, that is to say the use of force in the absence of self-defense, is the Security Council. Um, that any other action uh, by an actor acting on its own is impermissible because the only exception to Security Council authorized force is self-defense. And by assumption, we're not talking about self-defense here. Now, my view, as I state in the book, is that actually the law, as we see it in real life, is more complicated than that. And that the law simultaneously adopts actually two positions. Um, it adopts the black letter position, but then it also adopts what I call a context-dependent position. Um, and the context-dependent position is that in the real world, some unilateral humanitarian interventions are actually tolerated if they meet a series of conditions. I mentioned seven conditions um, that have to, to do with how they're carried out, by whom they're carried out, the motivations for how they're carried out, um, how quickly they're, they're ended, uh, whether they achieve their goal. Um, this is similar to sort of the myth system and operational code idea of Michael Reisman. Um, and we actually have the sort of co-presence of these two norms. And so I look at um, this situation, the, the rules as they are, under the two pillars. And what I say with respect to the black letter rule is that the black letter rule clearly passes the first pillar. I mean, obviously, if you have a complete ban on unilateral humanitarian intervention, you are going to advance peace because you're going to avoid all these situations where states are meddling in each other's business militarily because of human rights practices. Um, on the other hand, um, in that sense, the contextual position does not do quite as well under the peace pillar uh, because it opens the door for unilateral humanitarian intervention. Although I do think there's something to be said for the fact that the contextual position or the context-dependent position is at least more true to what states are actually doing than the black letter position. The key difference, though, is when we get to the second pillar, where, in my view, the black letter rule uh, fails. It fails because it leaves off the table um, a exceptional, but in my view, nonetheless morally necessary remedy for states to respond to gross abuses of human rights beyond their borders. And that, in that sense, we need something like the context-dependent position. Um, and I argue that, in fact, the context-dependent position does do a good job of balancing the two pillars. Um, and I also point out that the context-dependent position is consistent with just war theory. Um, it's consistent with the International Commission on State Sovereignty. Um, and I offer some comparisons between the black letter rule um, and um, uh, the just war theory and also between the context-dependent position. And my view is that the context-dependent position is not a second best position. It's not second best compared to just war theory and it's not second best compared to the black letter rule. It is in fact, I would say, the one that best achieves the two pillars or the two goals of global justice. It's the one that achieves both of those goals at the same time. Um, and that if we had rules that were much more permissive on humanitarian intervention, as some philosophers would like, and if we had rules that were much more limiting on humanitarian intervention, as a number of governments obviously would like, we would not achieve a globally just result. We would achieve instead two unjust results, unjust for different reasons. Um, and so in a sense, um, if we think that international law only accepts the black letter rule, and I certainly there are international lawyers who think that is all there really is, then I would say that international law is unjust. I think it's because I'm willing to characterize international law as actually involving both norms simultaneously that I'm willing to find more justice in the status quo than some who might say that, um, uh, some who focus solely on the black letter. 
But again, you know, I'm somewhat more, I'm somewhat of an anti-formalist, a legal realist, and so I like to look at the way states are actually acting and not just the black letter law rule. So this gives you a sense of how I um, carry out my methodology in the book. Um, I'd be happy to talk about my approach to other norms, uh, whether it's rules about sovereign equality or the Security Council veto or uh, the ban on the use of force or non-intervention or any of the other issues that I talk about in the book. Um, if you want to talk about those issues, I'm, I'm happy to discuss those. Obviously, happy to talk about um, theoretical questions about the framework and why I don't offer other frameworks. Um, but I, I, um, I just want to conclude by saying, uh, return to my original um, shtick here, which is that I really think it's very, very important for philosophers to be um, uh, fully engaged in what international lawyers are doing and for international lawyers to be fully engaged in what philosophers are doing. What, you, what you're doing is a rare example of that happening. Um, but I think that if we really want the Global Justice Project to work, we need to understand what's been achieved and we need to build on the foundations of what's been achieved. Um, and that means fixing what's wrong but not destroying what's right. Thanks. Thank you very much. Okay, so we now have um, time for, for questions. Um, so just to, just before, we're, we're, as you can tell, the microphones aren't projecting any sound. We're just recording it for the purpose of the video. So um, let me know that you've got a question. Then once you, you're called, we'll pass a microphone uh, to you. Yeah. Uh, Craig, yeah. Great. Stephen, thank you for... For this, sorry for coming a bit late and missing the introduction. Um, we've never met. My name is uh, Craig Scott, and I've, I've worked on some things that parallel. We met at the University of Toronto. Oh, briefly. After that's right. Ages ago. There that's was a right. forum there, and it was that's a long true, time ago. Yeah. That's right. That's right. That's right. <laughs> you guys are not getting old at all. <laughs> and you look exactly the same. It's six, 15 years. Can't even tell. That's true. That's true. I was thinking in other contexts we had met, but 9 11, right? Um, I just, uh, not to hog the mic, but I had two quick questions. One is on the, one of the two uh, examples you gave of where you were willing to, to talk about exceptions, the humanitarian intervention. And it's simply that when you uh, uh, talk in contextual terms, and, uh, and I, I agree actually that the real world actually does show some kind of a contextual norm. It, it, it doesn't relate purely, I don't think, to humanitarian intervention. It, probably relates to a few other gray zones as well. Sure. Um, do you see uh, any kind of institutional judgment component to that in the sense that is it, is, are these free-floating free seven conditions that philosophers will love to talk about uh, uh, unmoored from real-world institutions themselves uh, either explicitly or kind of implicitly making these judgments like the General Assembly, the Security right. Council, uh, affect it in interested states or whatever. Right. So that's my first question. Mm -hmm. and, the, and the second one, uh, just to get it in, so, I, uh, so you left off the first um, of your three, the uh, let's call it the more traditional extraterritorial jurisdiction issue. And, right. and given all your work on um, on jurisdiction and, 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 and in the context of corporations in the past, uh, I'm just wondering whether whether there's any update in, in your book on um, how do we think about this, this peace human rights pillar dynamic when it comes to, um, I'll, I'll put it as kind of in a proactive assertion of a form of nationality jurisdiction over uh, corporations so as to create a kind of a transnational access to justice in home courts for corporations. Um, where we get to still getting intense resistance to the very notion, and part of the reason is, is uh, in Canada anyway, we've we've we had a series <clears throat> series of judgments written by a Quebec um, trained uh, Supreme Court justice who seems to just delight in formalistic loops and and, and standing on his head and um, LaBelle and um, who just couldn't get his mind around very very black black line, uh, uh, black letter understandings of, of territory and, and jurisdiction in international law. And so we have, we have um, a series of judges in the Supreme Court <clears throat> that are now very, very unhelpful on this. And yet the civil stuff is kind of making its way just 
piece by piece to, right. to the normal rules of conflict of laws and you know the standard stuff. Um, and so to end, so it's almost like is there an update? But th this perennial question of you know are corporations themselves easing into some kind of a status position right. in international law that helps make this a different question now than it might have been even 10, 15, 20 years ago is kind of my question. Sure. Um, well, let, let me answer the second question first. I mean, I, I, I gave it an unbelievably simplified description of what the rules of international law are. And certainly international law already allows you know, states to assert nationality jurisdiction over their companies when they operate overseas. I don't regard that as inconsistent with anything I said because I don't think they're taking, in that sense, I don't think they're taking coercive measures to protect the population of those countries. They're, they're, regulating, their own, they're regulating their own companies. And I think they, you know, I think that there's no problem with that under the peace pillar at all. I don't think that, you know, if Canada decides that a Canadian company, you know, doing mining in uh, wherever, you know, decides uh, it has to file certain requirements. So, you know, we have, you know, in the Dodd Frank, we have a, you know, new conflict uh, conflict uh, mining uh, provisions. I don't think that interferes at all with interstate peace. And I think that is, you know, good for human rights. So I don't see that as being, I think, I think that's, you know, sort of, if you draw a line of justice, I mean, that's way above, way above thin justice. I mean, that's moving towards, you know, a much thicker notion. I think it's very much where international law should be heading. And I think it's, and I, and so um, I think that that kind of nationality-based jurisdiction should be encouraged. And I certainly think that every governance gap when it comes to corporations has to be filled. And part of the governance gap is capacity building by host states, and part of the governance gap is more regulation by home states. And you know the Basel Convention is based on the regulation by home states because because they knew that you know dump that dumping wasn't going to be handled by the host states. So, you know that's the pattern that has to be followed. I think the Ruggie process in looking to all the different um, levers of influence over the over the transnational corporations is you know is a very useful framework because it doesn't just talk about you know, it talks about the role of all different actors, those drafting investment treaties, those drafting contracts. Everybody's got to use whatever leverage they have. And obviously, the state of nationality has tremendous leverage over the, maybe the, you know, maybe the most leverage over a transnational corporation. And so I think that's a form of extraterritorial jurisdiction that, um, you know, is laudable. I don't think it's at all, I don't even see it as an exception to the territorial basis because I don't, because when I don't think of it as a sort of, uh, an extraterritorial um, use of state power on the territory of another state. What I would, what, when I th conceptualized as an obligation, though, you would. Well, I, I think what I was thinking of is, you know, more like the Alskani issue, which is, you know, if if a state happens, if a state happens to be acting on the territory of another state, which is really, I think, the way human rights law thinks of it. If you know, if British troops happen to be in another country, or Canadian troops, or law enforcement people. Uh, when do they do they have to comply with human rights? And to me, the answer to that, and again, I have you know, ten pages about it in the book, is an obvious yes. I think that um, any other rule, you know, I think that that rule that requires that when a state acts abroad, it has to respect human rights of those it affects, is again a not uh, is consistent with the first pillar, and in, indeed required by the second pillar. Otherwise, states could just you know, commit human rights abuses by acting on some other state's territory. Um, now, on your first question, um, yeah, I mean, I, I think there's a couple of angles in which I would take it. First of all, I do think that the contextual, um, the contextual context-dependent position that I justify in there is based on institutional reactions. It's not based on unilateral, like we think we did the right thing, so therefore, you know, the United States. It's really based on, you know, what were the global reactions to, you know, Vietnam and Cambodia or Tanzania and Uganda or Kosovo or, 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 or proposals for certain others. Um, and again, um, or, you know, if you look at uh, some positions that have been offered by a handful of states um, or, you know, what the General Assembly did after Kosovo is when the Security Council was blocked. So I do think that those factors come from, um, in terms of my observing what they are, they come from institutional reactions. But equally important, and maybe this is what you're getting to, I don't think that the context-dependent position should be entrusted 
to unilateral decisions by states. I mean, as the International Commission on State Sovereignty said, there have to be institutions that make these decisions. The problem is that we can't leave it only to the Security Council or we've assumed away the problem, right? If the Security Council could solve it, we wouldn't even need to be talking about this. And that's, of course, you know, the, in a sense, the big issue that the R2P leaves unexamined, right? They assume that we can deal with these issues, but they throw it back in the Security Council. What really is the hard question is what if the Security Council is blocked like it is with Syria? And I don't think those should be unilateral decisions. The question is, what are the institutional alternatives to the Security Council? Do we trust regional organizations? You know, if it's, do we trust NATO? Do we trust the Arab League? You know, those are huge questions that, uh, that are for, you know, further study. Yeah. Great, Stephen. I've always been very enthusiastic about this project, and it's not the first time that I hear. I think I heard an early instantiation when we met in Richmond last time, and I, it, it, it's great to be able to have access to the full book now. Um, I'd like to probe a bit more the interaction between your two pillars. Yeah. So discussions of global justice in terms of human rights, that is, there's a dime a dozen, right? So, so, so you know, Miller, Bites, uh, Wellman, everybody. Right tends to want to articulate these discussions in those terms, or at least to be willing to be conversant in that kind of, of representation of the issue. The issue of peace, though, is not as uh, front and, 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 and you know, of, of most of these discussions. Okay. And, that, and so I, I'd like to understand a bit more how that pillar works uh, in relation to the second one. So let's think about the laws of war, for example, the use and bellow. You might say the use and bellow doesn't really advanced peace, right? It doesn't even, you know, not detract from peace as it were. It's, it's sometimes used to legitimize it, right? So does that mean that the laws of war are unjust? Uh, and then I was uh, puzzled by your mention of sovereign equality, right? You're in good company when you say sovereign equality uh, fostered peace, right? Kant wrote about uh, the ideal form, or not, not, not so much the ideal form, but the Given the situation, given the world situation right now, a kind of federation of free republics would be the, the best way towards peace. But you could see, and, and you're sympathetic to a more practical approach, the way the world is going, climate change, right? The kind of resource curse, flow of refugees. You might think borders are actually a rather, uh, in, or increasingly so, perhaps an impediment to peace. Um, and so I haven't read that part of the book. I know you have something to say about sovereign equality. I was just curious to know what peace really plays mm -hmm, yeah. a, as, a, as a kind of first pillar? Is it logically prior? Is it to be balanced? Can, can it sometimes give way to human rights, like in the case of the laws of war interpreted according to human rights? Sure. sure. Okay. Well, two very different um, answers to the two parts of the question. Um, IHL is one of those core norms, uh, the subject of the 12th chapter of the book, where I basically think my framework does not uh, give us an answer. And I, you know, I say that I don't think that, you know, I, I, I just kind of accept the fact that this is not a totalistic sort of framework. And you've identified one of the key problems, right, which is that how do we figure out whether, you know, use in bello advances or detracts from war, right? You know, on one hand, people say it enables it, and on the other hand, people say it makes it, you know, it actually has ways of, you know, leading to a, you know, so, more solid peace if people observe IHL during the war. The other, the other pillar is even more complicated because it requires us to ask questions like, should we have the same human rights in wartime as we have in peacetime? And you get into the huge difference of, between Walser and McMahon on this question. Um, and so what I sort of say is um, my framework is not going to answer, you know, the sort of the right questions about what a just IHL would look like. Uh, now, that doesn't mean that we can't, my framework doesn't help us identify maybe what an unjust one would look like, like a, a norm that allowed you know, willy-nilly people to kill civilians would have some serious problems under any, under the second pillar, no matter what we think about what human rights people should have in war versus peacetime. We would all agree that there shouldn't be a, um, a unilateral right on the, on the attacking state to kill civilians. So it may help us identify some unjust things, but... It, I'm not able to say um, whether IHL passes um, my test. And I have different problems with international criminal law and international environmental law. I mean, with international environmental law, there's problems of intergenerational issues. Who's, whose human rights are we protecting? What about non-human species? And so we've got some big problems under the second pillar with IEL. 
Now, with respect to your, your question about sovereign equality, I think what I, what I do in the book is I try to really break down sovereign equality into three different norms, because I think it's right now, sovereign equality is sort of a principle, and I think you, have, you can't examine it qua sovereign equality. I, I assume, by the way, that states, we have a state system. So I don't go to sort of the foundations of the state system and say that the world is unjust. We need to start all, all, all over again. And frankly, not many political philosophers do any, or any more. The, the open border guys, right? Right, right, right. Company, right. So, right. so what I talk about with sovereign equality is it's a norm that talks about equal capacity for making law, equal obligations from law, and sovereign immunity. For me, those are the three elements of sovereign equality that are really the guts of sovereign equality. Now, some people say it means more, uh, you know, but, um, and what I talk about is, well, what are the rules about, you know, capacity to make treaties? And, you know, what about unjust treaties? And what about the, um, the rules about custom and, you know, especially affected states? And how do they cash out? And then I talk about sovereign equality, sovereign immunity as well. But basically what I do believe is that in fact, the three component rules of sovereign equality, of, of sovereign equality, do advance peace. Um, we may not; they may not be there. Their original justification may have been about, you know, this prince respecting that king, um, and it may have been about something else. But that, in fact, if we had a world where states were juridically unequal, um, if we had a state. Um, if we had, a well, let, let's just leave it there, it would, in fact, make armed conflict more likely. Um, because, you know, it's already a problem when states are juridically equal, but, you know, unequal in terms of power. Imagine what it would be like if it were juridically unequal. I mean, we had it. It was called colonialism, and it wasn't exactly the most peaceful time in the world. And so, you know, my argument is sort of that sovereign equality in its three different manifestations does advance peace. Now, you get to problems with respect to human rights especially on sovereign immunity. And in fact, one of my criticisms is about certain aspects of sovereign immunity when it comes to human rights. I just have a short rejoinder with respect to the first part of my question. So, so if your account doesn't speak to the laws of war and situations of war, it seems that in a way your account assumes peace over and beyond the fact that it's simply one of the pillar of the analysis, right? So you say it doesn't speak to situation of war per se, right? So, so there is this old dichotomy in international, in international law where like, you have the international law of peace and the international law of war. Is it that you're focusing on the international law, law of peace and it's that we should foster more of that, as it were, and I cannot speak to war? Or how, I, well, I, no, in the sense that, I, no, I mean, I don't think so because, I mean, I really, I have, you know, a significant part of the book is about Yusad Bellum which I think, you know, in the old categorization would have been part of the international law of war. I mean, you know, I talk about the ban, I talk at the, about the ban on the use of force, and then I have, you know, towards the end when I talk about human rights, I talk about humanitarian intervention. So both of those, you know, are, are part of use ad bellum. I don't assume peace. I mean, on the contrary, I really think that, um, you know, we live in a world where, where the threat or the reality of warfare is constant. The problem is that I don't, I have not been, I, either I couldn't when I, wanted to get this book done, maybe, you know, maybe with more thought, <laughs> I'll be able to figure it out. But when I was writing this book, I, I was not willing to, I mean, at a certain point, you sort of get to some you know, questions about Occam's razor and parsimony. You know, do you want to add more pillars? And do you want to like jigger, with, you know, figure, do you, how much do you really want to change the theory so you can pull in more things? And I really decided that rather than mucking with what I thought was a theory that did its work for most of the core norms, I would just leave these three aside for uh, as not really working very well and leaving it for uh, my next future thinking about global justice. Mm -hmm. just pass the microphone in the right hand, right? Thank you so much. I think, uh, I think your presentation is uh, fascinating. And I had the uh, honor to read, uh, uh, I think, three and a half chapters of your book, and <laughs> I was great, greatly impressed. Um, I do have uh, much sympathy to your argument about the pillars. I think you, you put your finger on the right things, um, peace and human rights. I think in terms of historical development, probably first peace and human rights, but you're absolutely right. I absolutely uh, agree with you in terms of your methods, starting from practice, 
uh, bottom to top. And so I'm very much fav uh, favorite of the project. Now, as respect to Francois's uh, questions, uh, I think he mentioned as uh, the name Kant, and he mentioned the relation between the two pillars, the relation between peace and, uh, and human rights. So I would like to ask a question uh, in, 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 in those lines. So first, Kant. Uh, so at, at least based on the three chapters, it seems to me that you refer several times to Kant's work on perpetual peace. And this is obvious. Uh, Kant provided very, very specific uh, instructions how to achieve peace. And I think uh, many of his uh, instructions actually uh, very much uh, related to contemporary reality. We can imply them. And although obviously you can uh, ch uh, raise charge against Kant that he was he was utilitarian, but obviously his uh, uh, instructions in terms of advancing peace uh, works and very much uh, plausible in terms of your argument. Now, I was wondering about the relation of Kant's work on perpetual peace was was written in uh, 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 1795 to his another work. Uh, which is, was written in 1787, called Metaphysic of Morals. And this work actually developed a, a so-called comprehensive theory of, uh, of rights, starting with uh, Kant's uh, famous uh, uh, imperative of innate rights of humanity, sp specific imperative for law. And he developed develop through, through, uh, from this imperative the entire structure of rights, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, contract law, uh, property rights, then he moves towards the very establishment of a, a modern state with public legal institutions, mm -hmm. towards uh, uh, international relations, cosmo uh, 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 right to visit, and mm -hmm. so on, towards the ultimate goal, okay. perpetual <laughs> peace. So here's the point. He seems to follow Kantian, uh, Kantian uh, ultimate goal of peace, but Kant seems to reach the same goal, uh, uh, taking the path of human rights. He starts with human rights, and he ends with peace. In other words, uh, he, uh, peace serves for Kant human rights. So for Kant, probably his path would be different. For instance, I think you say that for you, uh, peace means peace between states and, sta and peace uh, within states themselves. For Kant, peace means peace with, uh, between states. As respect within state, he would apply his theory of the specific state, which is public institution. If, the, if there's chaos within the state, he would say it's not rightful what we, he would call rightful condition, and he would justify humanitarian intervention based on different grounds. So I was wondering whether you would adopt actually truly fully Kantian perception, understanding of international law, because Kant it's very much similar to you trying to would probably address everything to explain yeah. everything yeah. sure so well, why not simply follow or at least confront kantian vision of the subject sure i mean i, I guess uh, i mean everything you say about kant is right and um I, I mean i guess i don't know sort of the short answer is that i feel like i'm doing something com completely different from what he did um, i am not trying to come up with a moral theory for a just world. Um, and he was, and he did, and it's a very famous one, and it's based on certain articles of perpetual peace and based on certain ideas of uh, what a just state looks like. Um, and um, there's some ways in which my views overlap with his, and there are others in which it doesn't. Um, my goal is not to tell us what would make a peaceful world, and it's not to make a claim um, you know, a, a detailed claim about the full relationship between human rights and peace. I mean, I, I make some very basic claims in chapter three, which is I don't think that human rights is a guarantee of peace, and I've got my examples, and I don't think human rights um, are um, purely instrumental. Um, uh, so, um, uh, excuse me, I, I, that's the same thing. I don't think human rights are more important than peace, and I don't think human rights are merely instrumental of peace. And I give examples for that. And that's about as far as I really am comfortable going uh, 
in a book like this whose real purpose is to examine the rules that we actually have agreed to. And so again, it's the difference between you know, ideal theory and non-ideal non theory in a certain way. And in the sense that my project is about looking at the rules that we have. And so for that, I make certain, you know, um, I think, um, rather obvious moves about the relationship between peace and human rights. But you know, um, they, are, um, they are grounded really much more in the history of the 20th century which Kant didn't have a chance to opine about, than they are in Kant. So, yeah. Thank you so much um, for the um, presentation. Um, I'm, I'm part of a, a graduate class, and we um, just finished reading the book, actually, in two sessions. Um, the entire book. Um, oh, um, thank um, you. <laughs> so we, we actually had two weeks of deciphering, and uh, my questions may not reflect. Deciphering doesn't sound good. It sounds like a hieroglyphics. <laughs> <laughs> my questions I'm may the not. I'm Rosetta Stone. I've got it right here. <laughs> uh, may not reflect uh, that level of care, but there was a level of care actually exercised in that Great. class. Mm -hmm. um, I have three questions. One is um, it seems that. Um, and correct me if I'm wrong on that. It seems that in your analysis of the book doesn't spend too much time defining the expectations on peace and, and human rights, right? At some level, uh, there is a description of uh, more uh, in length uh, on what uh, the rest of the book expects basically of human rights, less on peace. So it seems you are more forgiving of uh, the understanding that you present on peace as just basically peace, not as opposed, maybe as opposed to war, but not as opposed to the larger concept of conflict. And I'm wondering if that's intentional. So obviously, um, it's understandable why the threshold for human rights is uh, the rule should not, should promote, but at the very least should not detract. But um, on peace, it seems the analysis basically is much more forgiving as to peace as opposed to most right. obvious manifestations of not peace, right? But, but we don't know what that not, not no peace is. Um, the second question um, is uh, understandably, again, um, it's very difficult to step into the territory of political equality on the international arena. So I guess it's wise on many levels to uh, take that, uh, that out of the equation, and it's very well justified um, in the book as well uh, from the analytical point of view. But I'm wondering, um, despite that, obviously, the book goes back to that, you know, in the chapter on the uh, rules of admission on the elaboration of the book on sovereign equality. So it keeps coming back, mm -hmm. but not in the sense of political equality. Um, I'm just wondering, uh, in that sense, if that's the case, then what does this concept of impartiality on which you actually do insist very much, not you know, in lengthy passages, but in very uh, kind of obvious emphasis, so what does impartiality actually do if we are not, if we don't have to deal with political equality at all in the end? So if you could just elaborate on what you, because it seems when you're reading that first part, I think it's chapter three, if I'm remembering, mm -hmm. uh, or in the Two introduction three, yeah. maybe, maybe the introduction on impartiality. It seems uh, one expects that to come back and to play a role in the rest of the book, but it's uh, at least you know in my reading is absent. Um, and then the third question is that, could you say more on the very specific version of consequentialism that, because it seems the word consequentialism here could be replaced by pragmatism, practical considerations. I don't want to say instrumentalism because that, that's, that's clearly unfair. It's not instrumentalism. But it could be replaced by a bunch of other words that would basically give the same connotation of as a lawyer. Obviously, you know, one is uh, more concerned about the actual consequences. But in terms of the reason I asked that question is that 
particular versions of utilitarianism, for instance, um, worry very much about you know rules that even though whatever uh, level of happiness that they could or welfare that they could ensure for the greatest number, they would not touch the very worst off. And I'm not sure if that's basically the version that you even consider or you're trying to take consequ consequentialism in a very general way. Okay. Um, uh, okay, well, on your first question, um, yeah, uh, it's a fair point about, you know, maybe you say I'm forgiving on the narrow definition of peace as the absence of an interstate or internal armed conflict. And I guess I would say I'm, I'm, I would stick to that um, as the pillar for two reasons. Uh, one, and, and they relate to this question about why I don't have uh, different pillars, in a sense, as I was alluding to earlier. Uh, one is that, um, again, we think about there's lots of causes of violence in society beyond the armed conflict that I talk about in my book. There is, um, there's violence in the private sphere. There's violence in the state, you know, um, abuses um, criminal defendants or, 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 or black people when they're pulled over to traffic stop. There's lots of structural violence in society. Um, and that is not part of my definition of armed conflict. Um, and the reason is twofold. Um, number one is, again, because I assume that we have this body of law called international human rights law, which is meant to address this sort of, you could call it structural violence, if you will. Um, and so I am not seeking a, you know, I'm not describing the blueprint for all the international law we need for all of a just world. I'm assuming we have human rights law whose mission is to deal with violence and certain forms of violence in the public sphere and in the private sphere. And so I don't need my first pillar to do that. The more positive argument is that I don't think that all of the rules of international law either need, well, no, I just gave the need. I don't think all the inter rules of international law are capable of eliminating that kind of structural violence. I don't think we can count on sovereign equality or the rules of who gets into the UN, or except through you know very very, um, you know, I, I I you know connecting too many dots that I'm willing to connect uh, between the rules on who gets to sign a treaty and how that might affect structural violence in a society, um, and so um, I in a sense am taking account of what the rules of international law can do and also what these rules of international of human rights are meant to do. So that's why I have this narrow definition. OK, now the second question about political equality. I assume by political equality you mean equality of states or you mean equality of individuals. That wasn't quite clear. Yeah, right, exactly. Now, I don't think that the political equality of states, um, you know, I, I basically don't think that the political equality of states can be justified from an impartial perspective. Uh, I think that the legal equality of states can be, um, but I don't think that you know, there is any reason why China should be politically equal to Tonga. Um, I don't understand why anybody would think China should be politically equal to Tonga. It's got a billion more people. Um, and so I don't know what that really means. I can understand why you would think that Tonga should, should you know, be able to sign a treaty just like China can, and that China should be, you know, if China and Tonga sign a treaty, China should have no more legal rights to get out of that treaty than Tonga should. And I can understand why China should not be sued in Tonga courts, and Tonga shouldn't be sued in China court, Chinese courts. But I can't understand why, um, you know, the impartial perspective requires recognition of political equality of states. Um, the third point is about consequentialism and pragmatism. I, I certainly see why you might get that, um, get that impression when I, in, in the book. And I, I, do, I do mean consequential, consequentialism in a sense in which it's used by modern political philosophy or moral philosophy. 
in that it's looking at um, how a particular rule is going to, or a particular moral position, is going to uh, create effects. Um, and in terms of an aggregate of something, uh, an aggregate of peace, an aggregate of human rights, um, rather than simply uh, what our duties or what our motives might be. Um, I don't think that's the same as being pragmatic. Uh, I have this thing that I didn't circulate in the version that went out today called what I call the compliance corollary. And that really is where I think I try to maybe get a little pragmatic, which is that I say that there are certain situations in which, in a sense, um, we may have to um, uh, think very hard about changing rules that don't pass the two pillars. Um, and, um, and I don't deploy this very often, um, but there are, there are select times in the book where I say we have to be, I mean, the broader principle is the principle of pragmatism, which is that we always have to think about um, whether something is feasible. But I don't really employ it as a stop, as a trump on my reasoning, except in, in sort of very, very rare cases. Um, but I, I try to be informed by pragmatism throughout, but, uh, but, I, but, I, but I think my consequentialism is more, I, tr I hope my consequentialism is more of the typical consequentialism you see in, you know, in writings of Singer or Gooden um, or others who are philosophers who are both cosmopolitan and consequentialist. And so, um, uh, and impartial. So I enjoyed reading the uh, excerpts. I have to confess, I skimmed them. So forgive me in advance if I uh, uh, no problem uh, <laughs> if this is addressed. My, my question is sort of a variant of uh, Francois's question, which is basically um, there's sort of uh, an implicit. Uh, causation argument made about a link between uh, uh, international law being uh, having a causal impact on peace or on human rights. And um, I, I do think that there are a lot of cases where that, you know, is unclear. A lot of laws have unintended consequences. Um, yes. And, you know, um, I forgive my kind of empirical, empiricist proclivities, yeah. but like you – you know, you ideally would want a world where uh, you could somehow randomize the law and you'd have a counterfactual and you have a control group, a treatment group, and so forth. Right. But we can't do that in a lot of cases. Right. Now, obviously, you know, this is in one sense first order if that's kind of the way we're going, if you, if you need that in order to proceed. Um, you could say, okay, these are... This is for future research and things, but my, right. uh, but I, I kind of think that um, at the very least, having some a priori standards for causation um, right. would be important. And um, I'm I'm curious to sort of uh, know, uh, and if you've addressed this in the book, I, 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 let me know. I'm, I'm sorry, but if it's if it's just through cases, that that seems to be a little bit too. Uh, Specific. I think you'd want a higher level of, of generality than yeah. that. And so, can you give me sort of an a priori notion of what that causal link sure. would look like on a you know theoretical level, sure. and also you know maybe for an institutional designer um, sure. how they would go about implementing that? And again, if you've addressed this already in the text, uh, let me let me know. But that seemed to be something that I left with a little bit uh, unclear about. Sure, sure. I'm I'm really glad you asked the question because a couple of the reviewers have um, made the point, and, and I do think it's a, it's um, you know a weakness in some of my discussion. Um, so a couple points. Um, first, I n I think a project like this has to assume that international law rules have some influence on behavior. Um, that we're not just out in this world where, um, you know. I'll, yeah, I'll get, to, I'll get to that. But right, but yeah, right, but not, but it, but if you that. think if you think that if you're a, a true realist, an old-fashioned realist, and you think the law is purely epiphenomenal, no, this book is yeah. not going to appeal to you, yeah, right? That's 
yeah. I mean, okay, well, yeah. not to, there's still believers out. There's still people out there that believe yeah, that. So, okay. so I do, and and I and but I and I also I do say, and, and again, I don't think it's in, in the part that I said that you know I, I'm not delusional enough to think that the rules on the use of force determine you know have a have a uh, you know are are related in a but for way to um, you know whether or not wars take place, that the causal connection is weaker. And that there are many things that influence states, whether states go to war, other than what the rules of war are, and and similarly with other things. So it's something in the middle, right? And then yeah, that's that's that middle that we're trying to kind of figure out, right? Um, and um, so that's the first point. The second point would be, no, I do not have an a priori standard of causation in this book, um, and but my defense of that, to be honest with you is that I don't think, not, not only do I not think, I, I, I'm confident that what I'm doing is no different from what other consequentialists do in philosophy, which is that you marshal the best evidence you have, um, most, a lot from social science literature, um, sometimes from you know, individual case studies where you see the issue joined, and you make the best case you can. And if somebody finds um, better evidence, then you change your mind. Um, and, uh, and so, for instance, you know, my views about secession are deeply informed by many cases where I believe that, that secession uh, promoted uh, in instability in armed conflict. Um, now, you know, if somebody says, yeah, but what about the fact that the Czech Republic and Slovakia split up? I say, okay, yeah, what about it? You know, I, I say, well, I can give you five examples of where, you know, uh, where, where we had you know, increased instability as a result of, we would have increased instability as a result of two permissive secessions um, or, 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 or risk of armed conflict. Um, so you, so you know, what a couple of the reviewers said was I don't use enough social science literature to make my point, enough social science studies, and I think that's a, that's a fair point. Sometimes, as I say, I'm making my seat of the pants arguments. I think what you're making is sort of a broad and, and justified critique of consequences reasoning. And so that's what, you know, the appeal to deontology is, look, we just got to find what the duties are. And we don't really care about what happens. Obviously, you know, we don't want unintended consequences. But we're mostly looking at, you know, reasons and duties and less at effects. And, um, and that is appealing in, in many ways if you want to avoid some of this big methodological problem. But I think you know if you you know, at least from and, you know, maybe the philosophers around the room can can correct me. But you know my reading of a lot of the literature on basic problems of consequentialism is this is a very very old issue, for consequentialists, and it's the it's one of the obvious points of attack, um, by deontologists and by contractarians and by others um, against the whole methodology. If I may just yeah yeah sure. I mean at a minimum you'd want to you'd want to set up a minimal evidentiary link standard or if that's possible or at least to consider yeah. no, to I, consider I, that and right. uh, that might I appreciate be something that's a little bit yeah. more attractable and might yes. move things forward but I I'm not a philosopher and I don't you know know the standards necessarily of the of the discipline but I'm just saying as a that that was sort of yeah I mean I I I mean I you know as I say, I rely a fair amount on, on Gooden's work. I've had an, I had a number of conversations with him about this issue, and and he actually you know gives a, a couple of pages about this in his utilitarianism as a public philosophy. Uh, I think that's what the name of the book is. A uh, book from about twenty years ago, which is you know yeah you, you kind of do the best you can uh, when you're predicting consequences, and if you really think that that is just so fraught, then you kind of got to give up consequentialism. But but you're right. I can do a better job with coming up with some a priori standards of uh, of causation. So thank you for the suggestion. You, you made me say that um, uh, if the questions, if the line of discussion debate has come down to uh, criteria of evident, you know, evidential bases, uh, standards of causation, and so on, that you've already accepted the consequentialist framework right. to begin with. That's right. That's exactly right. And yeah. you've, a consequentialist would say, I'm happy that we're now talking about right. evidentiary basis rather than, because you know, the hard philosophical work has been done if yeah. you've got acceptance for consequentialism. Yeah, I, yeah that's where so I So that's a friendly kind of problem question, to have. Actually, yeah. A yeah. consequentialist said, yes, that's that's the right problem to have. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Rather than trying to limit discussion for, for 
duties. Yeah. Yeah. So just on your immediately to your left for our next question. Hi. Hi. How are you? Good. Um, in relation to your second pillar, um, if you can explain what is customary law and um, how does it how does it connect to cultural relativism? But well, both of these issues in relation to your second pillar, uh, second pillar and generally what it is. Do you mean customary international law or something else? Uh, be, uh, do you mean customary like the uh, uh, customary law in the sense of the customs of a particular country or people or culture? Well, the local practice of okay. political agencies yeah. by domestic leaders, for example, yeah. okay. and I'm assuming that has also international implications? Uh, it can. Um, I mean, um, there are different usages around the room, and this is what's interesting about having you know, different groups around the table. Uh, for an international lawyer, customary law means customary international law, the law formed by the practice of states, nation states, with a certain attitude of uh, legal obligation. Uh, for others, um, customary law is uh, the customs and practices of a particular community which may or may not be written down in the laws of that state. Um, I would say that my second pillar is based upon internationally recognized human rights. Um, and I try to come up with a list that is short enough that it is um, not subject to the critique that it's culturally specific or culturally relative. Um, I'm, you know, I teach human rights. I've been teaching it. I'm actually teaching it right now. We're having many classes on cultural relativism, um, and it's a, obviously a huge challenge to the whole field. Um, at the same time, um, you know, I do think, uh, and at least I certainly try with my with my list of basic human rights to come up with those in which um, it would accommodate a wide variety of cultural practices, a wide variety of what you might call customary practices, um, and so that's why it is, you know. Um, not a list that would be the full range of human rights because I want to, I want to, um, in a sense, put aside uh, an argument uh, up front that my list is somehow a Western list. So, in other words, it's Eurocentric. No, I say it's not. Oh, it's no, I'm not. saying I say my list is short enough that I believe it can withstand any criticism that it's Western or European. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I want to, to um, I sort of, as I was uh, reading bits of the book and the, and the paper for today, sort of comparing Buchanan's idea about um, um, you know, what he would take to be the foundations of a, a moral system international. I, I think he shares very much, uh, and I think you're, you're absolutely right. One of the refreshing parts of the book is trying to combine you know, international uh, uh, law discussions and debates with philosophical work on on global justice. And I think Alan Buchanan is in the same, mm -hmm. right, try, and trying to develop what he calls an institutional right. uh, moral theory. Um, so as I was you know, reading bits of the book and, and um, listening to, uh, today, thinking of a couple of questions which for me are kind of un, uh, uh, uncertain, uh, comparative questions between uh, your account and his account. One's on on the role of peace as being a, a kind of pillar, a basic principle. Because uh, I did have this question, why these two pillars? Why not a third one, something that looked like sovereignty? Not just in the three norms that you sort of cashed out, which I thought was helpful, but also as a kind of intrinsic good, which is valued. Um, but for, for, for Buchanan, peace isn't, isn't one of them. It used to be one of the pillars of international law, but its, its consequences have not been terribly good. It's not been successful in that front. Uh, it has, especially interstate conceptions of peace, has been much too permissive for sort of internal state uh, conflict and, and violence. Uh, so, so part of his argument is that we need to get, we need to, to eliminate peace from that, and think about just consequences for human rights abuses being front and front and center. So you might say, well, has he eliminated peace or simply reduced it to various kinds of human rights abuses that that could reach systematic levels? Um, and the second one was just a curious question about uh, about self determination. So he's got these. I can't remember exactly. I won't try and try and list the four criteria for when, uh, you know, the norm of self determination that you'd find in the uh, 
ICC, International Covenant of Political and Civil Rights. Okay, it doesn't, the right. ICCPR doesn't it's say much about self-determination. No, it's Maybe. just that one article, isn't it? Yeah, just the yeah. very first article, yeah. Um, but he's got these four standards of success or, or success criteria. It's got to be minimally, re for any proposal for extending the norm or developing uh -huh. it. Okay. It's going to be minimally realistic in the sense it doesn't violate territorial integrity. Morally progressive, so uh, it has to actually advance in a morally sound way. Uh, consistent with morally defensible laws and avoid perverse incentives, I think is the is the fourth mm -hmm. one. So I'm just curious whether how how your account sort of you know are there are there competing success criteria that that could be formulated or yeah differences from his his yeah. his view on self determination particularly. Well, um, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, you know, if you look at Alan's early work on secession that he did in the 70s, maybe like the very first piece he wrote. I mean, he, when he comes up with his sort of uh, views, it seems like peace is quite important. Uh, in terms of how we judge the morality of secessions, um, when you get to you know when you get to the book uh, on whatever it's called, self determination and international law, whatever the one is from like five ten years ago now, um, the one before the human rights just, book, justice, justice self legitimacy and self determination or something like that. Yeah, right. <clears throat> he begins to move in a much more human rights centric uh, position, and I guess you know <clears throat> I would say. I don't think he's gotten rid of peace. Um, I think you might say that peace would be for him, that maybe his idea is somewhat like a reversal of my pillars uh, and with a ro more robust first pillar, and which is sort of not too far from where I end up in my, in my final chapter, which is to say it's sort of, we need to have a set of international law rules that do maximally protect human rights, but do it in a way that doesn't harm peace. And that's, as I say, that's sort of where I head at the end of the book. Um, and I think, for instance, when you look at his actual views about secession, you know, or his, even his views about humanitarian intervention, he does not believe in, like, we should be, you know, using force to solve every human rights problem around the world. I mean, he really does recognize that, you know, interventions, you know, you shed blood, and they don't just shed interstate blood, but they can make things worse domestically. Um, I agree he does see, you know, the sort of, you know, he does come from a starting point that is skept that, that sees interstate peace as kind of overvalued. And to that I just I just basically kind of disagree, I think. I don't think that interstate peace is overvalued. Um, you know, um, look what Europe's been able to do in, you know, 50 years without wars. And look what's happened in Eastern Europe in, you know, in the last 20 years when they've had wars. Um, interstate wars are devastating. For human welfare, from a, you know, from an impartialist perspective, um, and so before you even get to the question of you know human rights, um, so um, you know I think that um, I, I think that he, although he is let's say compared to uh, Wellman and Altman and uh, and um, Phil Pod and some others. Um, I think he's much more willing to take peace into account. Um, I, I don't think he's quite where I am because he, you know, resp responding, I think, rightly to the, the, the sort of rap that international law has, that it's just about, you know, a bunch of autocrats protecting each other's interests, right? That the whole structure is about this corrupt state, you know, protecting the resource privilege of that corrupt state, and it's just kind of a deal among nefarious actors. And the ones who really suffer are the people in each country. And you know, Poga has a similar starting point. And my view is, yeah, it may have started out that way, but there are a lot of advantages for both the interstate level and the people within states of that deal that sanctifies the ban on the use of force and sanctifies sovereign equality, um, but that we need to have exceptions to that to deal with internal human rights. And I think we, our balance ends up being a little bit different. Um, I think, you know, again, what I admire the most about Alan's work are two things. First, he actually knows and studies the international law rules. And so that gets a lot of, I think that's really makes his work a, a profoundly different level. You know, roles in, you know, law of peoples. I mean, when he comes up with his 10 principles of international law, he's relying on a 1964 treatise by Brierley that was like, you know, 
out of date within 10 years of being written if it wasn't out of date when it was written. And you know, that's just you know, the most blatant example. And Alan doesn't fall into that trap. And the other thing that Alan does, and I you know, quoted it at several points in the book, is he really believes that institutional, uh, institutional realities need to inform our moral reasoning up front and that the institutional realities are not things that we come up at the end as, you know, oh, now we have to cut the second best because we don't have an ICJ that can, you know, adjudicate every self-determination dispute. I mean, he realizes that when we come up with principles for self-determination, we have to do it with the knowledge that there is no one body that is going to tell us what, what that is, as opposed to, you know, Simon Caney and, you know, others who will say, okay, here's exactly the way we ought to have the self-determination rules, and now all we got to do is get the ICJ to have mandatory jurisdiction. Well, guess what? That's not going to happen. But even if it did happen, if you look at the ICJ as an institution, every single politically contentious case it gets, it runs as far away from it as it possibly can. It did two weeks ago, I was saying at lunch, in a case where it was challenged about the legality of nuclear weapons by some of the nuclear weapons cases, and it found a way to throw the case out based on lack of, uh, uh, based basically on moot, not quite mootness, but lack of a dispute. And so, you know, too much philosophy doesn't take that, uh, you know, institutional um, roadblock into account. And they would say, well, that's because we're doing ideal theory. But my view is, if we really want to change the rule, change the world for the better, we need to be more conscious, and I think Alan does that really well. Any final questions? Okay, well, great. Um, please join me in thanking. Okay, you. thank you very much. Thanks for coming today. I appreciate it. Really enjoyed all your questions. Oh, thank you so much. Okay, great. <laughs>